Hi everyone, thank you to the Cosmology From Home organisers for the opportunity to give this talk. My name is Peter Sims, I'm a research scientist in the Low Frequency Cosmology Lab at ASU, and today I'm going to talk about deriving constraints on astrophysics during the epoch reionization via a joint analysis of 21cm Lyman line and CMB datasets. This work was done in collaboration with several other researchers in the Radio Experiment for Analysis of Cosmic Hydrogen and elsewhere, who I've listed here on the title slide. I'll begin with the bigger picture and an overview of the science case, then I'll describe some of the details of the constraints on realization that we include in our analysis. Okay, so here's a schematic of cosmic history. And on this timeline, on the left, at high redshifts and early times, recombination is observationally well constrained by measurements of the cosmic microwave background. And on the right, at lower redshifts and late times, the post reionization universe is observationally well constrained by galaxy surveys and other probes of large-scale structure. In comparison, cosmic dawn and epoch of reionization in the intervening redshift range is weakly constrained. During this period, the first stars and galaxies in the universe form, and the emission of ultraviolet light by those sources culminates in a phase transition in the state of the hydrogen intergalactic medium. There are many outstanding questions of astrophysical and cosmological interest associated with this epoch, but three I'll focus on here are how did the timeline of ionization proceed? Was it a gradual, long duration process, or did it happen more rapidly? And when I talk about the duration of ionization in this talk, the metric I'm using for this is the redshift interval between a mean hydrogen IgM neutral fraction of 75 and 25%. Secondly, and related to the first question, how massive were the galaxies and halos in which the sources driving ionization formed? Were molecular cooling halos or small but numerous atomic cooling halos the largest contributors to ionization? or were larger atomic cooling halos the dominant sources of ionizing photons? And finally, how did galaxies and quasars that formed during the epoch ionization influence the thermal history of the IGM, which is something that current 21 centimeter cosmology limits can weigh in on? Looking at observational probes that can be used to understand this period, in this presentation I'm going to focus on the CMB power spectrum and in particular constraints on the CMB optical depth and the high redshift contribution to the optical depth from Planck and an upper limit on the duration of realization from SPT. High redshift 21 centimeter emission constraints from radio interferometers and constraints on the timing of realization from Lyman line galaxy and quasar observations. First I'll say something about the physics and origin of these constraints starting with the CMB. So at redshift 1100 we have recombination and for the next 0.1 to 0.2 giga years CMB photons are able to free stream across the neutral universe during the cosmic dark ages mostly unimpeded. By that point dense regions of gas are expected to be collapsing to form the first stars and galaxies at cosmic dawn. These sources emit ultraviolet radiation, leading to the ionization of the surrounding neutral gas and the onset of the epoch of reionization. The presence of free electrons due to reionization has several knock-on effects on the CMB and its measured power spectrum, namely Thomson scattering of CMB photons on free electrons produced during reionization suppresses the CMB temperature anostrophies on large scales and contributes to the measured CMB optical depth. Scattering of quadrupolar temperature anisotropies introduces power in the polarization power spectrum on large scales in the form of the realization bump, the amplitude and shape of which can be used to infer the contribution of early star formation to the CMB optical depth at high redshift, with the contribution between redshift 15 and 30 being the parameter estimated by Planck using this method. And finally, the scattering of CMB photons from free electrons in realization bubbles around sources that have a bulk motion relative to the CMB rest frame imparts secondary fluctuations in the CMB on small scales via the patchy kinetic sunyev zeldovich effect. The change in the power spectrum resulting from each of these effects is a function of the ionization history of the IGM during realization, and thus one can turn that around 
and use measurements of these effects in the CMB to constrain the timing of reionization. On top of the CMB constraint, an electron in a hydrogen atom can undergo a hyperfine transition, flipping from an aligned to an anti-aligned state relative to the spin of the proton, resulting in an emission of a 21 cm photon, or vice versa in the case of absorption. The hydrogen 21 cm spin temperature is a function of the relative number densities of atoms in the high and low energy hyperfine states, and high redshift 21 cm cosmology experiments aim to measure the contrast between the 21 cm spin temperature and the radio background temperature in the early universe. Either as a function of redshift and spatial scale in the case of the power spectrum, or the sky average signal strength as a function of redshift for the global 21 centimeter signal. And the amplitude of these signals is a function of the ionization, density, and temperature state of the IGM. And measurements for upper limits on the 21 centimeter signal therefore enable one to constrain astrophysical parameters of the IGM and properties of the sources ionizing and heating it. Finally, Lyman series photons emitted when electrons in hydrogen atoms drop from an n greater than 1 orbital down to the ground state have a very high optical depth to absorption by neutral hydrogen. As such, between the middle and end of reionization, observations of Lyman line absorption in high redshift galaxies and quasars using a range of techniques enable one to infer strong constraints on the hydrogen neutral fraction at those times. Okay, so that's a brief overview of the observational probes that we consider. While each of the individual datasets associated with those probes can be used to independently constrain astrophysics, one can obtain a broader, completer, and more robust picture of the high redshift universe by jointly fitting them within a self-consistent modeling framework. Assuming the datasets are independent, the joint likelihood of measuring them is simply the product of their individual likelihood functions. In those likelihoods, we use a common underlying 21 cm space model of the universe implemented in simulations by Fialkov, Bakana and collaborators. Ultimately, those simulations are used to derive emulators of the sky averaged intergalactic medium neutral fraction, XH1, the 21 cm power spectrum, and the global 21 cm signal, each as a function of the astrophysical parameters theta which in this work are the star formation efficiency of early galaxies, the minimum circular velocity of dark matter halos hosting star forming galaxies, the X-ray brightness of the galaxies relative to local analogs, their ionizing efficiency parameterized by the CMB optical depth that produces, and their radio production efficiency. One informative way to visualize our modeling framework is to look at the impact of changes in the astrophysical parameters on the modeled summary statistics, such as the global 21 centimeter signal shown here. The black dashed line in each of these plots shows a fiducial global 21 centimeter model defined by the astrophysical parameters listed on the top right. Each panel of the plot then shows the impact of varying one of the parameters within the prior range used in our analysis, which are shown in the color bars, while holding the others fixed at their values in the fiducial model. The main takeaways from these plots are firstly that most of the parameters of the model have a significant influence on the expected global 21 centimeter signal. However, to first order, the effects of varying the star formation efficiency, the minimum circular velocity, and the CMB optical depth are to translate uh, the signal in redshift due to change in the fraction of gas collapsing into stars, delaying star formation, or changing the galactic ionizing efficiency. In contrast, changes in the galactic X-ray or radio efficiency scale the amplitude of the signal with low X-ray efficiencies translating to low levels of heating of the IGM and a low 21 centimeter spin temperature, and high radio production efficiencies 
translating to a high radio background temperature, and the combination of the two resulting in the greatest contrast and producing the largest 21 centimeter signals in absorption. So a global 21 centimeter signal upper limit will tend to constrain the posterior distribution of the X-ray and radio production efficiency, and a detection will constrain all five of these astrophysical parameters. We find a similar story with the 21 centimeter power spectrum, where the black dashed line shows a fiducial power spectrum that assumes the same parameter values as the global signal model. And again, the power spectrum is sensitive to changes in all of the astrophysical parameters, with the X-ray and radio production efficiencies scaling the power spectrum amplitude. And low X-ray and large radio production efficiencies producing the largest power spectra that one should expect to be the first to be ruled out by existing 21 centimeter power spectrum upper limits. Finally, this plot shows the same thing, but for the IGM neutral fraction. And here we see a qualitatively different parameter sensitivity, with the dominant effects being changes in the effective galactic ionizing efficiency, parameterized by the CMB optical depth, implying a later start to reionization for lower optical depth values, and larger minimum circular velocities corresponding to more rapid reionization dominated by more massive galaxies. And these are therefore the two parameters that we expect to be well determined by neutral fraction and optical depth constraints, such as those from CMB and Lyman line datasets. Okay, so studying the previous plots effectively gave us some predictions. Now let's take a look at the data and the results of their joint analysis. In terms of datasets for CMB, we use constraints derived from Planck and SPT data. For Lyman line, we use IGM neutral fraction constraints deriving from high redshift galaxy and quasar observations with VLT, MMT, and several other observatories. And for 21 centimeter, we include power spectrum constraints from HERA, LOFAR, and the MWA. This triangle plot shows the posterior distribution of the parameters resulting from the joint fit of constraints deriving from these datasets. And we see that the constrained parameters can be understood in the context of the parameter sensitivity plots we looked at a second ago. In particular, the 21 centimeter power spectrum upper limits primarily constrain the combination of low galactic X-ray efficiency and high radio production efficiency, disfavoring the top left corner of the 2D posterior of those two parameters. The data sets that constrain the neutral fraction, in contrast, primarily improve the constraint on the CMB optical depth, which we actually constrain to approximately a factor of two more stringently than Planck data alone, as well as the minimum circular velocity of dark matter halos hosting star-forming galaxies, for which we find large values are preferred, implying rapid and late reionization driven by large galaxies. This complementarity of the different datasets can be seen even more clearly in this plot from our preliminary analysis showing the 1D marginal posterior densities of the four out of five astrophysical parameters constrained in our analysis. In this plot, the dashed black lines in each panel show the prior probability densities of the parameters, and the solid colored lines show the posterior densities as a function of the data the constraint derives from, with the most stringent constraint from the full joint analysis shown in dark blue. The primary contributors to the joint constraints on the minimum circular velocity and the CMB optical depth posteriors on the left hand side can be seen to be the CMB and Lyman line based constraints, which are shown in purple and red respectively. And the primary contributor to the X-ray and radio production efficiency joint posterior on the top right are the HERA plus MWA plus LOFAR 21 centimeter power spectrum upper limits shown in green. 
In the last minute or two, I'll briefly return to the global 21 centimeter signal. And overlaid on the signal, I'm now showing the 50 to 130 megahertz observing band of the initial deployment of REACH, the radio experiment for the analysis of cosmic hydrogen. And the black dotted line shows a 25 millikelvin noise level, which is similar to the noise level in the publicly available EDGES2 data, and which, barring systematics, is also forecast to be achievable with a season of REACH data. And I show this just as an illustration that at this signal to noise level, a large fraction of signals in the prior volume are potentially detectable in this redshift range. Okay, I'll finish with a summary slide with the main takeaways being that EOR science return is enhanced by joint analysis and from our joint fit of Lyman line, CMB and 21 centimeter derived constraints, we find Firstly, that in our models that are consistent with the full range of datasets, reionization is rapid, late, and driven by massive galaxies. And secondly, that galaxies with both X-ray efficiencies below those of local analogues and radio efficiencies above those of local star-forming galaxies are disfavored. Finally, there are good reasons to expect that incorporating global 21 centimeter signal constraints from the REACH experiment, the Next Generation Edges 3 experiment, or other global 21 centimeter signal experiments in our joint analysis will facilitate further improvements on our constraints on the EOR astrophysics in future. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions.